and Tabas both post were pre-colonial and colonial times. In the pre-colonial times, it had a different <coughs> form, meaning, and purpose. Today, it carries with it the colonial experiences and has changed in terms of form, meaning, and purpose. The colonial scholars documented the pre-colonial work from Eurocentric perspectives to do justice to the work to the best of their abilities. It is a common feeling among the essentialists that these kinds of undertaking by colonial scholars have stripped the pre-colonial literature and art of the true meaning and purpose. However, the sense of loss that many feel strongly is not shared by us translators. Taking Oyanta's example in particular, the scholarly interest of Valdez in pre-colonial art and literature motivated him to prepare the first manuscript in H4. While putting it in writing, he appreciated the work with the resources his Eurocentric perspective offered him. To him. Eurocentric is not a colonial word. What we call Eurocentric today was then a way of understanding, interpreting and defining the world around. The ills of Eurocentrism of which we are now aware were simply a thought process. Therefore, it is certain that with all his good intentions, the first manuscript must have suffered in terms of meaning and content. We do not intend to search we did, we did not intend to search for and compare the original pre-colonial Oentai with the one documented by Antonio Valdez to skim the Eurocentric element out from it and to get the translation translation of the so-called original work. We made it a point not to make this translate translation a project a decolonizing a decolonizing project. The version that we were provided to translate was a post-colonial one written in Spanish with notable mestizo and indigenous elements, the work itself is an example of continuous negotiation in which the native, Spanish and mestizo societies have been. It is in no way a pure pre-colonial work that the advocates of essentialism would have wanted it to be. This idea of purity has not bothered us, bothered us at all. We are a post-colonial society as well. And when Oyanta's manuscript was in preparation, India was fighting her battle to stop Europe from taking her over. Here we are now, a transformed society in every way, with a rich and painful experience of colonialism. For this reason, we see a clear relationship between the original and the translated. This is not like saying that the Peruvian post-colonial experience has been the same as the Indian one, and still we recognize the difference of colonial experiences of, the, of these two nations. Nevertheless, the tools of the colonizers were universal in different colonized spaces. However, these tools were only able to transform the pre-colonial societies and could never replace them totally. The version of Oya Oyantai, whose translation you will read, is that syncretic version that we are talking about. We have used our rich linguistic heritage as a post-colonial society to our advantage, that we needed not only an intimate understanding of the source language, or let's say languages, because it has uh, Quechua words and expressions, but also the context of the original text and the power relation <coughs> in the Inca social system. The task of translating this Inca drama, which seems to be tempered by the Spanish priest, possesses uh, a difficult challenge in translating the play into Hindi as the drama abounds in Quechua phrases and expressions, and the poetry and diction of many of the scenes made our work as translated even more, translators even more difficult. A dramatic text cannot be translated in the same way as a prose text. It should be noted that a theoretical, cannot, a theoretical text cannot be treated only as a purely literary text, as it is impossible to separate the text from the performance due to the dialectical relationship between the two. In a play, the dialogue takes place both in time and space and is always embedded in the extra-linguistic constitution characterized by rhythm, intonation, pattern, tones, etc. Therefore, the written theoretical text cannot be translated in isolation without considering the added criterion of theoreticality. For us, being able to capture these additional dimensions was a challenge in translating the present theoretical text. As translators, one of the concerns which, uh, which uh, was whether to domesticate the text or not. 
and how to maintain a sense of fidelity. So, uh, as translators, our strategy has been uh, a kind of docile resistance to domesticate the text with the idea of taking the reader as far as possible towards the text. And whenever necessary, the foreign identity and the linguistic and cultural differences of the source text have been maintained, thus making the readers realize that they are reading a translation from a foreign <coughs> culture. Our effort has been to ensure that the meaning is not completely lost when translating into Hindi. We have tried to retain the sense of the original, a sense of fidelity, not only to the form without necessarily tying ourselves to the words. But there is an effort of mediation. On the one hand, we want to move the Hindi reader as far as possible towards the original text, since the text on which we based ourselves is not original either. Our mediation consisted, on the one hand, in maintaining features of the source language, suggesting as far as possible some linguistic and cultural differences in the source language, source text. However, the challenge was to maintain the spontaneity of reading in the target language, that is Hindi, and to achieve the same effect in, the, in terms of the receptive process. This back and forth between two experiences was a major challenge for us. Moreover, in this play, there are many Quechua names and words through which the character make many puns. Our challenge was how to deal with the Quechua names and words and what conscious choices we made while translating them into Hindi. We understand that reading a play can be a little flatter than seeing it performed. As translators, we have made conscious choices about which Quechua names and words to retain and which to translate into Hindi. Some choices are detrimental to the text or were detrimental to the text as the characters make many puns and this gets lost uh, uh, when translated in another language. In such cases, we have chosen to use the characters name or words in Quechua and have used footnotes to clarify the meaning or explain the pun. For example, one of the characters, Kusiko Yud, is called Joyful Star in Quechua. So other refer, others refer to her simply as the joy or the star. Likewise, another character, Rumini Aoi, is called Ojo de Piedra, Stone Eye in Quechua. So whenever he is around, we find mentions of stone and rocks. For example, in scene 8, Act 2, Rumini Aoi says, Sali con una piedra y con ella he peleado. So, I went out with a stone and with I fought, I have fought. Likewise, the names of other characters make pun in Quechua. In addition, there are references to places Anti Soyu, Uru, Pampa, Koyao, Saksa, Uaman, etc. Plants, animals, Tunki, Yama, Puma, some customs, Inti, Raimi, Kipu, Yaravi, Akla, Uasi that are Inca. We have chosen to use the original word in Quechua to preserve the original culture and in some cases we have used footnotes. Let us now see a few more examples how we try to ensure linguistic transfers and also the transfer of the function of linguistic utterances in the target language. So uh, like my fellow uh, translator has just talked about uh, the challenges, another challenge uh, as translator uh, have been to ensure linguistic transfers from the source language to the target language, not only at the level of discourse significance, but also the transfer of the function of linguistic utterances in relation to other signs of the theatrical discourse, that is auditory and visual. In some cases, we have chosen to reconstruct the dialogues for a Hindi-speaking audience. For example, the long monologues have been split as monologues of such length are not part of Hindi stage conventions. Uh, in the play, we have found uh, the use of adjectives. For example, from the very first scene in Oyantai, the adjective palomita, uripilai in Quechua, which means little dove, is used to express a deep feeling for the loved one, a peculiarity of the Inca culture. In translating it into Hindi, we have replaced this adjective with other adjectives in Hindi, according to the Indian context. For example, when Oyanta addresses his beloved by saying, Siempre de amara esta tierna paloma. In Hindi, 
we chose to use the adjective hansli that is goose instead of kabutri dove where whereas in uh, when inka pacha kote addresses his daughter kusi koyor using this adjective ven paloma ami pecho here we opted to use the adjective meri pyari koyal mi kerida kuku in the same way when kusi koyor addresses her daughter pitusaya by saying ai palomita there in hindi we translated it to oh meri pyari kokila ai mi kerida kokiliyo o for us translators it was equally challenge how to deal with the cultural nuances of the metaphors particularly dealing with a foreign text <clears throat> another area of concern has been how to translate metaphors it is how to deal with the translated translatability of rhetorical figures of speech to exemplify how differences in cultural facts can cause difficulties in translating metaphors we can look at symbolic meanings of certain words in distinct cultures for example in scene 2 act 1 when oyanta says es el león anda acompañado del mal presagio that lion is accompanied by bad omen the element leon that is lion and mal presagio that is bad omen do not in our opinion fit together well in their metaphorical nexus we therefore opted to use the word sucks people type Uh, for leon lion when the strictly literal equivalence of some words led to confusing meanings we resorted to meanings instead of signs for example in scene 3 act 1 when pikichaki says me había dormido como una piedra i had fallen asleep like a stone we have translated it as mere me ghode bech kar so gaya instead of saying me patthar sa so gaya although the le- uh, the letter uh also seems acceptable acceptable however the word patthar stone evokes a spirit of grandeur in the inca context uh on the other hand the use of the term sorry the word ghode caballo horse gives the correct meaning in hindi but in pre colonial setting there was no horse how does the translator balance between the temporal and of this nature there are several such cases we are only mentioning a few to highlight the problem we also had to face challenges while translating the native inca jaravis songs so translating the native inca songs that is jaravis for example uh, in scene 6 and 10 of act 1 we find uh, jaravis songs there we have uh, tried to create a suitable equivalence Uh, by maintaining the poetic spirit of the original songs and that was an arduous task for us uh, as we all know that in oyantai the inca sounds appear in two forms uh, or or rather say two uh, songs the like kachua and the yaravi in in this inca play we find uh, the inca sounds in the form of two types of songs while dealing with this yaravi song Uh, we would like to share an anecdote of our experience of translating uh, while you are translating the yaravis no the word to yar as i mentioned earlier appears in the yaravis the sad songs repeatedly in the original text initially we presumed that to yar was nothing more than a part of the chorus with no actual meaning and repeatedly appeared in the song to give the yaravi a musical effect however while reading rio's grandes by argedas one day I realized Toya was a bird, which has been described in great detail by the author in this book, Rios Profundos. Only then uh, were we able to correct our mistake. Argedas beautifully describes the Toya bird and what it means for the people of Peru. He says that the Calandrias were singing in the mulberry bushes as if they had been trained. Usually, they perched on the highest branches. They were also singing and swinging in the tops of the few weeping willows. weeping willows uh, that grew among the mulberries the native bird for calandria is tuya in ta- its tiny yellow black winged body may easily be seen against the sky and the coloring of the tree the bird flies from one branch to another higher or to another neighboring tree to sing changing its melody its songs transmit the secret of deep valley from the beginning the men of peru have compiled music on hearing it and seeing it wing across space beneath the mountains and the clouds which in no other part of the world are so extreme 
Toya Toya, as I listened to its song. Had we not encountered this critical piece of cultural information in Rios Profundos, we would have messed up the translation of the Yaravis, that is the Inca songs, terribly. So one can see that there are many cultural details disguised in this drama, which at first sight looks like a drama revolving around the themes of valor and love. Despite the hurdles, we have tried to translate this play into one of the most important languages of the world. From the very first draft to the final draft, we feel that there could be areas that we can consider improving, and that, and that is what we believe is the nature of translation. As Alfonso Reyes, the greatest, the great Mexican writer, once said to Borges, "I quote: We have to publish what we write because if we don't." trying all the possible variations, we don't stop modifying it and we don't go beyond that, fin uh, end of quote. In Spanish we say, uh, it is, uh, he said, cito, tenemos que publicar lo que escribimos, porque si no lo hacemos, probando todas las posibles variaciones, no paramos de modificarlo y no vamos más allá de eso. Fin de cita. The fact is, Several revisions have taken place based on the discussions with Professor Ganguly and Sri Anupamji and Neeraji from the editorial team of the Sahitya Academy regarding the linguistic and the cultural nuances. We have allowed it to be published only when we were fully satisfied. As Walter Benjamin describes in his work, The Task of the Translation, the task of the translator, translation is a continuous process and no text is final. We hope that the inevitable variations or deviations that might have appeared in the process of translation will be rectified by those who choose to read this translation with a critical eye in the form of a new and improved version. It gives us immense satisfaction to be able to provide this translation, which we hope will contribute necessary material to strengthen Hispanism in India in general and to the knowledge of Peruvian literature in the vernacular language in particular. We hope that the students of translation and comparative literature would find this as an elementary text to understand the other culture. As a concluding note, uh, we translators would like to thank His Excellency Ambassador Carlos Rafael Polo, Mr. Fabio Sovia, Cultural Secretary, for their support to the project. We would also like to thank Dr. Marco Martos, President of the Peruvian National Academy of Letters for writing the preface as well as the Ambassador for his introductory remarks for the edition. We would also like to show a deep sense of gratitude towards Professor S. P. Ganguly for writing a reflective piece for this edition, for advising us on the translation and for evaluating the present text. Last but not the least, we would also like to thank especially Dr. Srinivas Rao, Secretary Sahit Akadmi and his entire editorial team led by Sri Anupam Kumarji for their unending support in bringing out this publication. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias.